Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And wow, wasn't that quick. Epic has already decided to appeal the decision in Epic versus Apple as came down last Friday. And before we get into the substance there, I want to thank everybody that has made an antitrust Epic one of our most popular playlists. 54 videos will be 55 as this goes up. And to everyone that has checked out what has become one of our most popular videos on the channel on the decision itself, even though it's more than two hours long. I'm very, very thankful to everyone who has looked at that video, who has talked about it, who has shared it. Uh, again, I'm just trying to get good information out there. And unfortunately, on this particular ruling, a lot of bad information was instead presented to you all. But today, Epic has announced that it is going to appeal that ruling. Unfortunately, we don't actually have a lot to go on just yet. If you aren't familiar with this process, uh, Epic versus Apple was tried in the Northern District of California. That's the Ninth Circuit of the federal justice system. So they give a notice of appeal. And basically, that's all this is, is just a notice document. It says, notice is hereby given that Epic Games, plaintiff and counter defendant in the above named case, appeals to the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit from the final judgment entered on September 10th, 2021, last Friday. And all orders leading to or producing that judgment, including but not limited to the Rule 52 order after trial on the merits and the permanent injunction, each entered on the same date. And then there's a bunch of pages of signatures and other things that are required by the circuit court itself to register that the appeal has been made. Now, if you're looking at that and you're saying, Rick, that doesn't say anything. Where's the good stuff? Where's the substance? That will follow. This is effectively the first step in getting your foot in the door in that appeals process. You can see here in the Ninth Circuit and generally in the federal justice system, you have about 30 days to appeal that. You can appeal by right, which means that if you've got a judgment against you, you can go straight to the appeals court. And that's what Epic has decided to do. Now, you might also be saying, Rick, I didn't watch your video, or maybe I only watched parts of it, and who can blame you? But I saw a lot of headlines last week. I saw a Kotaku headline that said, Epic wins big. Okay, I saw a Verge headline that says, Apple must allow other forms of in-app purchase, or that the Epic versus Apple ruling could put a serious dent in Apple's $19 billion app store business. How do we arrive at a place where Epic winning big is the party that's appealing the judgment made in this lawsuit? Well, there's a number of reasons, and we can summarize what we talked about in that two and a half hour video, but if you didn't watch that, one of the important things to note is that Epic lost on almost every count that they brought. They brought 10, and then Apple countersued them for breach of contract, which Epic also lost. And in that 10th count, they didn't really win in the way that they had initially presented the way they wanted to win to the court. And that's gotten confused in all of these headlines because a lot of what people have read into the judge's determination is that developers, regardless of whether it's Epic or not, because Epic currently isn't allowed back on the Apple Store, that developers would have the right to either put things in the app directly, which the court definitely doesn't say, or in sending people out of the app to avoid Apple's 30% commission, or as Epic calls it, the app tax. Depending on how you feel about that, you might have more derogatory language to describe that 30%. I can't blame you one way or the other. But what's important to note is that almost all of that is wrong. Fortunately, because I've been hard on The Verge, I want to be nice to them when it's apparent, I found yesterday they put up an article in which they actually got it right. No surprise to those of you who have been following along in virtual legality on this topic, the article that gets it right is from Addie Robertson, who was the reporter that we were following throughout the trial because she was summarizing the day's events and doing a very good job of it. And we use that as the baseline for our analysis of what was happening on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, she's got a long article here. I will, of course, link it in the description to this video. You should check it out because I think it does the best job by far of summarizing all aspects of the trial and also took a while. It came out on Sunday and it was a 185 page document. One of the things I was saying on social media when the document came down and people were asking me about it and I was saying, oh, that's basically wrong. As I was reading through it to prepare my own video, I was saying, look, any article that's coming out right this second, which was an hour after the judgment was made, is going to be done too quickly. I'm reading very, very fast. I know what I'm doing. I'm highlighting things. I'm prepping for the video, but it's not going to be ready, as it turns out, for another six or seven hours from that point when I was having those conversations. Ms. Robertson here, to her credit, took her time, went through it, and came out on the right end of understanding what was happening here. 
And what's happening here, the reason Epic didn't get really any win is because of the following. Apple could collect an Apple tax even without in-app payment charges. Or as she says, developers like Epic don't just care about controlling payment methods out of principle, although it offers some unique benefits like getting to handle refunds. It also offers things like getting the money first, right? One of the things we talked about with respect to why Apple wants to control that in-app processing is because it's better in almost every circumstance to get the money and be the one splitting it amongst your various commercial partners than to be relying on those commercial partners to do the splitting. Part of that is just security. You'd prefer to have it on your own back rather than someone else doing it for you. Other reasons are speediness or attention to detail or maybe even monetizing the data you could collect from these kinds of things. There's a number of reasons why you might still want to have an outside processing source that isn't just a dollar for dollar fee discount kind of situation. But as Ms. Robertson continues, they, the developers, care about ditching Apple's 30% commission. And Rogers says bluntly that it's not so simple. In fact, Judge Rogers said it a number of times and in a number of different ways, right? As we said, while the court finds no basis for the specific rate chosen by Apple based on the record, the court still concludes that Apple is entitled to some compensation for use of its intellectual property. Or to the extent Epic Games suggests that Apple received nothing from in-app purchases made on its platform, such a remedy is inconsistent with prevailing intellectual property law, both concepts that Ms. Robertson brings up. She also brings up a footnote that I didn't highlight in my video, and I think it's crucial to understanding how Apple might deign to treat this in the future. In the footnote, the judge says, in a hypothetical world, developers could potentially avoid the commission while benefiting from Apple's innovation and intellectual property free of charge. If they were to just figure out a way, if you're Fortnite, if you're Epic, to say, all right, we're going to put a button in, you're going to pay for us offline, outside of what's happening here, and then we are going to just get that money direct. We don't owe Apple anything, but we're operating on Apple's phone. We're using Apple's store space. It's digital shelf space, and Apple doesn't make a dime. Judge never was happy with that concept, as you just saw with those quotes. And in this footnote, she continues, the court presumes that in such circumstances that Apple may rely on imposing and utilizing a contractual right to audit developers, annual accounting to ensure compliance with its commissions, among other methods. Of course, any alternatives to IAP, including the foregoing, would seemingly impose both increased monetary and time costs to both Apple and the developers. All right, so she's talking in this portion of the decision about why IAP is useful, that Apple isn't just pretextually asking for IAP in order to use monopoly rents and make more money. There are reasons why it's a good idea because if they don't have it, yes, they can go through normal contract rights to get their money, but it's going to be more time consuming and problematic. Now, she also finishes off by giving the injunction that is at the heart of all these headlines that suggests that Epic won the day. But it's important to understand why Epic doesn't think it won the day. It's also important to understand that when Tim Sweeney, CEO of Epic Games, comes out with a tweet that says we lost, you should probably take that on its face and figure out why Epic thinks that. But if we look at the actual complaint from way back last year, that Epic put forth against Apple. Count 10 is what they quote unquote won on, and it's the California unfair competition law. But let's see what they say is the problem under that law. It says Epic has standing to bring this claim because it has suffered injury in fact and lost money as a result of Apple's unfair competition. Specifically, it develops and distributes apps for iOS, has developed a payment processor for in-app purchases, and Apple's conduct has unreasonably restricted Epic's ability to fairly compete in the relevant markets with these products. And Apple's conduct is also, quote unquote, unfair within the meaning of the unfair competition law. It's this paragraph 289 that the court actually winds up using as kind of the backstop for the injunction against the anti-steering rules we're going to take a look at in just a second. But the court gives no purchase to any portion of the argument that is respective of the payment processing or Apple's ability to control distribution of apps in its ecosystem. Apple wins on every count there. They're not a monopolist. If they were a monopolist, they don't violate the rule of reason. So you lose on Sherman 1, you lose on Sherman 2, you lose on California. You had no right to breach the agreement. So you're suffering under that breach concept. Apple can keep you off. Apple can kick the rest of your stuff off. You owe them 30% on the money you collected while you were in breach. And what we give you is, well, we think the anti-steering rules are nonetheless unfair. So the judge puts forth last Friday 
Accordingly, a nationwide injunction shall issue enjoining Apple from prohibiting developers to include in their apps and their metadata buttons, external links, or other calls to actions that direct customers to purchasing mechanisms in addition to IAP. And that doesn't mean a whole lot to anybody because those aren't really defined terms, but we can tie them to what is the current Apple developer guidelines, 3.1.1, that says apps and their metadata may not include those things buttons, external links, or other calls to action that direct customers to purchasing mechanisms other than in-app purchase. So what Apple is prohibited from doing is not locking people to in-app purchase. That sentence survives. It's prohibited from telling folks or from telling developers that they can't tell folks that they can get V-Bucks or whatever currency they want outside of the in-app ecosystem. And she makes a good point. She makes a lot of good arguments about why that might be the case and why she has ruled in that fashion. I do think Apple has some grounds for appeal should they want it uh, insofar as she tries to extend the application of an equitably based California law to the entire nation in a fashion that is seemingly at least problematic under constitutional and judicial powers concepts, but at bare minimum isn't really well argued either way. And if it is good enough for the nation, it's not well argued why it isn't good enough for the globe, except for the fact that you don't really want to be extending your power if you're a federal judge too far, because you are likely to get whapped on the nose by either the Court of Appeals or, God forbid, the Supreme Court. So after all this is said and done, what you've got is a situation where Epic can't get back on the App Store. And developers, even though you've got this myriad of headlines saying they can avoid the 30%, really can't as The Verge finally, as of Sunday, yesterday, properly comes out with. So Epic says, this is a total loss. We owe $4 million plus dollars. We owe legal fees. We lost on the nine counts we cared about. We didn't get a right to sideload, put our store up, use our processing. To the extent we won anything, we got the ability to put a link in the description of our app or something to send people off app. And even then, the judge has said, well, Apple should still be entitled to some amount of money. Now, to understand why that is, and I think this is a place where people are also getting tripped up, I want to add a little bit more clarity. I talked a little bit about this in the South Korea video I did, talking about the South Korean law that requires Apple and Google to allow for separate processing directly in their app. And I said, well, that's fine. It doesn't change the fact that Apple still is entitled to a commission by contract. And in order to understand why that is, it's important to understand that the processing, the movement of money through the in-app payment system is not what Apple's getting paid for. In the contract that you agree to with Apple to get access to their ecosystem. And here is that contract. It's called Schedule 2. It says, you hereby appoint Apple and its subsidiaries as your agent for marketing and delivery of the licensed applications to end users. And there's some other language here to talk about countries where they need to use different language. But you are hiring Apple to get your stuff distributed out to end users and to market it for you. You're getting that digital shelf space. For the purpose of this schedule, it's important to note, the term licensed application, which we'll see in a couple of places, includes content functionality, extension stickers, or services offered in the application itself. So we're talking about in-app things, V-Bucks, uh, digital footwear, whatever it might be for any given type of game. Licensed application includes not just the point of sale originally, but also the in-app stuff. It says, in furtherance of Apple's appointment under section 1.1, they're your agent, you hereby authorize and instruct Apple to market, solicit, and obtain orders on your behalf, provide hosting services to allow for the storage of and end user access to the applications. You give Apple permission to make copies of, format, and otherwise prepare the applications for acquisition and download, including adding the security solution and other optimizations identified in the agreement. You allow Apple to arrange for end users to access and reaccess copies of the license applications. You authorize distribution of your license applications for use by multiple end users when the license application is purchased by an individual account associated with other family members. If you're ever wondering how family sharing works, a developer in the Apple space agrees to it as part of the license that if there are family members under the way Apple is controlling its various account permissions, then you agree that your application can go to them and you don't get paid again for those various family members. You agree that Apple can issue invoices, which relates to the processing concept, or that it can use your screenshots, previews, 30 second excerpts, trademarks, logos for promotional purposes in marketing materials and gift cards in connection with vehicle displays. I don't actually know what vehicle displays applies here. Maybe somebody that makes Apple apps for a living can come into the comments and let me know how vehicle displays comes into play in the contract. 
and most importantly, for marketing and delivery in general. You also get the right to Apple. You give that right to Apple to facilitate distribution of pre-release versions of your licensed applications. And for the sake of clarity, no commission is owed with respect to that distribution, implying, as it will be stated later expressly, that commission is owed for everything else in this schedule, right? We scroll down and we see that you owe Apple 30% if you're a developer, not because you hit their button to process that payment. The judge in her decision alone shows that Apple actually uses an outside payment processor already. I think they use Visa, where Apple pays that processing fee to Visa and collects whatever the remainder is, 28%, 27%. And so this isn't about that processing. This is about everything else we just talked about. And it says, Apple shall be entitled. This is what you're agreeing to with them to the following commissions in consideration for its services as your agent under this schedule, everything in this document, for sales of licensed applications to end users, including again, that in-app content, Apple shall be entitled to a commission equal to 30% of all prices payable by each end user. Now understand what that means in legalese. It's a full stop kind of concept. It's you owe this money. There is no requirement that we have processed your funds, that we've done anything else for you because we're doing these things. You agree that we're doing them for you in terms of distribution and marketing and everything else. You owe us 30% when someone buys something, whether it's your app or something inside your app as it's played in our ecosystem. Now we have other rules about this. We have the small business program for less than a million dollars. We have things like recurring subscriptions. But in general, upon collection of any amounts from any end user, as the price for any licensed application delivered to that end user here under, Apple, when it gets that money right now as mandated through its processing, Apple shall deduct the full amount of its commission with respect to that licensed application and any taxes collected by Apple and shall remit to you or issue a credit in your favor as the case may be, the remainder of those prices in accordance with Apple standard business practices. Said another way, right now, where you have to go through an app payment processing, you don't have any other fights about anything else, then you get a dollar, that dollar goes to Apple. Apple says, okay, that's 70 cents to you, 30 cents to us. And we remit that 70 cents to you after we make sure that you don't owe anything else and withholding or taxes or anything else like that. But it's not tied to their actually taking the money in themselves. Contracts all over the place have concepts of a 30% fee or a royalty or a commission or whatever you want to call it. And as a separate portion of the agreement, who's going to get that money initially? We're going to take a look at an example of that that we covered in the South Korea video in just a second. Importantly, in 3.5 of this license document, it also says, you hereby acknowledge and agree that Apple shall be entitled to a commission in accordance with this section 3.5 on the delivery of any licensed application to any end user, even if Apple is unable to collect the price for that licensed application from that end user. So, you are Fortnite or someone else, you deliver something to an end user, you use your own external thing that gets you that money. As it stands right now, this contract, even unamended, says you, you agreed that you owe us 30% for appearing on our store. So we assume that when you get that dollar, you'll be getting us that 30 cents because you've agreed to that by contract. And I think people are missing that. That isn't to say that this document wouldn't be amended if Apple just accedes to the injunction and changes some of the way it does business. It would be because it's a little bit unclear as to how this works in the absence of in-app payment processing. And you can see things like here, references to the things that are gonna be prohibited for Apple if it came down to it. For instance, in addition to using the in-app purchase API, a licensed application may read or play content that is offered outside of the licensed application. This is the reader app concept provided that you do not link to or market external offers for such content within the licensed application. That wouldn't fly anymore. And in fact, I don't think it flies with some of the stuff that's happening in international regulatory regimes in Japan and otherwise. So that would be changed anyway. Apple will evaluate these things and change them as they do. But as an overall kind of spirit of the law concept here, if you are selling something on the App Store, you're agreeing to pay Apple 30% of the money that you make because you're present on the App Store, because they're distributing it for you, because they're using their innovation and their intellectual property to make sure that end users get what they get and to be able to track those things, to use the family system, to have the security solution, whatever else it might be. And that's why they get their 30%. It's, it's not just the payment processing, which is something that the court acknowledges. In fact, the court says, look, there are ways that this is handled. There's this is ways that this is handled all over the place for people that don't collect the money directly. And we can use as an example, the same one we used in that South Korea video, 
Epic Games and their licensing of the Unreal Engine. If you're not familiar with this, Epic has an engine to make video games. I happen to think it's a fantastic engine. I don't hate Epic out of spite. I just don't like the theory of the case against Apple. I think Unreal is wonderful and it's helping to make some of the games that I love very dearly. The way their business model works is they say, hey, yeah, absolutely, you can have this. And then you owe us a certain amount of money on the products that you used our engine to make. And you'll report that to us. Here's a paragraph early on. When you generate revenue from a product or distribute it to end users, you must provide Epic with advance notification as early as reasonably possible, including the name of the product, the format of distribution, the unique product ID where applicable, and the distribution channels. Look, here's the deal. You're signing a contract with us. You owe us X percent. And so we are going to assume that you're going to report as you are promising to do in black and white in this contract and then we'll work on it from there if you are somehow a problem actor that isn't reporting properly. And what's that percent? Well, we scroll down, we see you owe a royalty. You agree to pay Epic a royalty equal to 5% of all worldwide gross ev revenue actually attributable to each product, regardless of whether that revenue is received by you or any other person or legal entity. Now, I highlighted that in red because that's interesting, right? We're talking about third parties getting money or avoiding specific parties. Epic has language that says, hey, look, we don't care where the money goes. If you made something with our engine and somebody got paid, you owe us a royalty on that because that's how our business works. And that includes a whole host of different things that you might not think of as normal revenue. Sure, it's gross revenue resulting from any and all sales of a product, but it's also gross revenue resulting from in-app purchases, gross revenues from Kickstarters to give access to the product, your revenue from advertising in your application, Revenue from advanced payments uh, for the product from a publisher or other partner. Revenue received in connection with a product's inclusion in a streaming subscription or other game de delivery service. You get that Game Pass money, that App Arcade money. We get a cut of that as well. And then if that isn't good enough, we get revenue in any other form attributable to the product. And I don't blame Unreal. I don't blame Epic for drafting it this way, but that's an umbrella term. What does that mean? Revenue actually attributable to a product. If you can't name it in the first... F letters of your list, what, do, what am I supposed to be worried about in terms of that revenue there? Now, they also have exceptions. You won't owe royalty on the first million dollars, or if in a calendar quarter you make less than $10,000, or the first five million if you're going through the Oculus store, because we've got some kind of deal with Facebook and Oculus. We've got all sorts of rules around that, but those rules are all premised around the fact that you're going to tell us what you made. And no, it doesn't mandate that Epic gets the money in the first instance. This is the way that business is done for companies that don't get that money in the door the first time. It says within 45 days after the end of each calendar quarter in which a product earns revenue outside of the above listed royalty ex exclusions, you must pay to Epic the full amount of the royalty due for that quarter and send Epic a royalty report on a per product basis. You're agreeing to this contract. If you don't do this, we can sue you for breach. And we actually were talking about this license because Tim Sweeney, before the decision came out, was making a signal to how bad he thinks Apple is by taking out the termination concept of this license. And we were talking about how that was relatively silly in a commercial context. But even then, they can still sue for breach. You've agreed to pay them 5%. You take their license, you make a game, you make a million dollars, you owe them 50000 That's the way it works. And people are coming in saying, well, Apple would never do that. But if you really think about it, if Apple has to allow external links to a way to purchase something and they can say, hey, if you click on this link, you're going to report to us how much money you make from somebody that comes from a link in our application. That's going to be deliberately and directly tied to what the store, what Apple, what their intellectual property was actually providing to you. I don't see that as the greatest hill to climb, the biggest deal in the world. Now, others have asked, well, if they just come to the Fortnite store and they buy V-Bucks and they want to play them on the Apple store, is that a problem? Probably not. If you come separately, that might be okay. But if Apple is going to have to allow these things, one of the things that I would expect Apple to do, outside of potentially just saying, all right, we're going to increase developer charges and we're going to charge per download, we're going to do all these other things, potentially, is to say, look, if somebody comes directly from a link, you're going to keep track of those and you're going to keep track of how much money they give you and you're going to give us our commission, whether that's 30%, whether that's a different number in that context, depends on what Apple's trying to do politically from a business perspective, and it could be anything. But the judge is very clear that Apple is still owed money on something that is directly related to its intellectual property. We're thinking about it in reverse. 
I think this has helped some people that have had this conversation with me in the last couple of days. The judges said Apple can't be left out in the cold. If Epic were allowed to put Fortnite on their store and have a link out of it directly from the Apple store, from that digital shelf space and say, come buy them over here. You buy them over here. You don't owe Apple a thing. Doesn't Apple make nothing for the intellectual property that they've provided? And the court is very clear that that shouldn't be the case. So Apple's always going to have the right contractually to say, look, you owe us 30%. They did that in the current license. They could make it clearer, and I suspect they will if they don't wind up appealing. But it's not the end of the road for Apple when you start talking about these things. It is the end of the road for Epic because they're not going to be allowed back on the store. And you see Epic also dealing with the fact of reporting. In Section 7, you agree to keep accurate books and records related to your development, manufacture, distribution, and sale of products and related revenue. You will keep books and records that relate to the money that you might wind up owing us. Epic may conduct reasonable audits of those books and records. Audits will be conducted during business hours on a reasonable prior notice to you. And I've seen all over the place on the internet folks saying, well, you would never be allowed to audit books and records because it's confidential material, et cetera, et cetera. This is a very, very common term in contracts of this type. And if you don't want people getting into the rest of your books and records, you keep those books and records separate for this purpose which is all a long way of saying there is nothing stopping Apple from asking for that money. I think they already do ask for that money, and I would expect them to ask for that money in even a more clear capacity in their license documents if they accept the ruling of the court. It's why Epic is appealing this entire injunction, decision, everything that came out last Friday, and why, as we see also from The Verge just a couple of hours ago, Apple hasn't decided whether to appeal the ruling at all. It says in a call with reporters, a representative said Apple was still evaluating its legal options and had not made a decision about its next steps. Apple hasn't taken a position on whether it will ban any Epic-related apps beyond Fortnite. Asked for comment, a representative said Apple is still looking at its options regarding Epic's future on iOS. While Apple won most claims, it was found to be violating California's unfair competition law with its anti-steering rules. A court order will require it to let developers link to alternate payment options outside their apps although they still need to use Apple's in-app purchase system within them. Again, Ms. Robertson, The Verge, getting things right now after a couple of days of footfalls. And so we look at this and we say, well, I still think Apple will wind up cross-appealing. This will all just be one action done before the Ninth Circuit on the notion that the injunction goes too far. It applies California law in an untoward way. And they can try to fight the application there. They might decide that they're going in this direction anyway and they were going to change their contracts anyway due to Japan or what have you and not even bother to appeal it that far. Uh, But ultimately, it's clear just looking at the way the parties have presented themselves who thinks they won and who thinks that they didn't. Now, the other last thing I wanted to talk about as part of this video was the notion of what an appeal means. I've seen a lot of folks asking me questions in DMs and elsewhere about how often things get overturned, what the number of cases is, what this process looks like. So the next thing that will happen is that a brief will be filed on the part of Epic. We will get counter briefs. We could also potentially get briefs from friends of the court that aren't parties to this actual decision, but will be affected by it. And they are allowed to brief on their own, paying their own lawyers to actually give more information to the court so that they can comment on it more fulsomely. And we'll see how that goes. But in terms of numbers, Thankfully, the Ninth Circuit, which covers all the West Coast of the United States, has a very nice annual report that they put together on this topic. It says, new appeals filed with the Ninth Circuit numbered 10,400 in fiscal year 2020, while appellate filings nationwide numbered 48,190. The Ninth Circuit continued to be the nation's busiest federal appellate court, accounting for 21.6% of all new appeals nationally, which is enormous. It's an enormous percentage. We have a lot of circuits in the Ninth that covers this huge, big swath of American jurisprudence. It's also why I think it's a little bit unfair sometimes. A lot of people comment on the fact that the Ninth Circuit gets overturned at the Supreme Court a lot. First of all, the Supreme Court's only looking at really controversial things, generally speaking, but also the Ninth Circuit covers so many cases a year, it's very often going to be the ones that are going to be overturned at the Supreme Court level in any event. Which leads us into what kind of cases are appealed. It says Ninth Circuit district courts, which serve as trial courts in the federal judicial system, accounted for 59.7% of new filings in fiscal year 2020. That's us. The Epic versus Apple case is a district court in California being appealed up to the Ninth Circuit. It says the district court generated 6,211 new appeals, remember out of that 10,400 number, and of that total, 5,170 were civil appeals. So the Ninth Circuit's looking at 5,000 or so civil appeals like the one we're talking about in Epic versus Apple. In fiscal year 2020, 
Cases terminated on the merits, meaning they were finished by the court, not killed or executed or anything else. They're terminated on the merits. We actually looked at the question presented that were affirmed or enforced, numbered 4,430, with 632 reversed, 59 remanded, and 776 dismissed. So the vast majority are affirmed. Whatever the trial court said is affirmed. But I skipped over a little bit of language here, which you probably looked at if you're watching this on YouTube, that says, in terms of describing it as affirmed or enforced, that number includes appeals that were affirmed in part or reversed in part. Meaning, the appellate court doesn't have to decide that the trial court is wholly wrong or wholly right. As you can probably imagine from 185 pages of documentation at the trial court level, the appellate court can decide that some of the stuff is right and some of the stuff is wrong. If they decide that some of the stuff is right and some of the stuff is wrong, then that will count as affirmed. So Epic could still have big wins here and fall under the category of affirmed. Stats like this don't really help us to understand whether or not Epic has a good chance to win or not. What we can tell is that the chance of a total reversal is relatively low. Or as this report says, the court's overall reversal rate was 9.9% compared to a national average of 8.8%. Either way, below a 10% chance that Epic gets a full reversal of everything that the court decided. And you could argue they don't want a reversal of that count tent claim, except that they do because they want the unfair competition law in California to be applied to what they view as the antitrust actions at the Apple level, that they're violating all those rules, both Sherman and California. And so they're unfair under that competition law in California. So we can look at this. We could say, first of all, Ninth Circuit handles a whole lot of cases every year, 10,000 plus per year. We get 5,000 or so coming from the district courts as civil cases, and that 4,400 of them are affirmed, at least in part. And that's the most likely outcome here is that some or all of what the district court has decided is going to be affirmed, which is to say, Epic's got a very low probability chance of getting total reversal. And because all of the counts that they brought kind of live on top of each other, that Sherman 1 and Sherman 2, very similar, that the California claims very similar to those antitrust claims at the Sherman level, we would expect either a total reversal or maybe a reversal that results in only small changes to the injunction itself. And that's the state of things. We are now officially in round two of Epic versus Apple. Epic will be appealing. And you can bet when these briefs are filed at both the Epic and Apple level, we'll be covering them here in virtual legality. If you enjoy these conversations about the business and law of technology, video games, and pop culture, please consider supporting the channel. We've got a Patreon and other ways to support us. Or just subscribing, telling friends that we're having these conversations. A lot of you put that video that we did last Friday on the decision up in various forums and on Twitter and elsewhere. I saw them all. I saw everybody commenting, leaving me DMs. I very much appreciate the effort. And I think the channel's growing and we're having good conversations. So I appreciate you helping out in that regard. If you caught this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it as a podcast, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.